Thank you, Riv. Game one in our second series, they're going to TDK. Yeah. The first thing I want to look at here is the, is champion select in the way that the uh, pick spans played out here because we talked about which lanes this match would hinge on. One of those lanes being the mid lane, the unknown of how Poe Belter and Alex each would match up. Yeah. Now, it turned out that in the, in the microcosm of the mid lane, it was fairly even. We saw both of them pretty close to killing each other solo, uh, and they traded back and forth, even CS coming out of lane. However, that LeBlanc pick that Zyrene and uh, Riv were talking about there yeah. in the tank meta didn't have the burst potential there in, in the la latter parts of the game to be effective. And I have to wonder if he can stretch his champion pool to something that you know, the Ziggs maybe that can have a greater team fight effect. Yeah, well, and the thing about LeBlanc, though, is, is though you're in this series with a whole bunch of tanks, these tanks have really low lockdown. You're not facing a Maokai, right? You're not facing people who are going to really reliably stun you. It's a Mundo who's not going to pin you down, a Morgana support who's not going to reliably pin you down, and Gragas who can, okay, maybe a little bit, right? But he's got a Corky and a Sivir to go hit. Like, LeBlanc's got targets, right? You kill Sivir and Corky off, you're not going to win the team fight anymore, so I feel like compositionally, Winter Fox should be fine. I mean, we saw Faker pick it in game five to go to the finals. Ruined the game, right? Like, he completely... It's like, I mean, I think LeBlanc is still very good. Yes. And, and he picked this LeBlanc into the double AD comp, right? Seeing the competition saying, okay, I'm going to kill Corky or I'm going to kill Sivir, and failed to do so. You mentioned the fact that mid lane went equal. That's good for Corky. Yeah. He got counterpicked by an assassin and thrived. That means Alexich won the lane. So, hey, you know, we talked about mid lane being an unknown. Well, so far, point one to Alex Itch won the game, survived your lane he's supposed to lose. Cool. Good thing so far for TDK that, you know, that's one unknown checked off the box. Well, and then we go to the top lane, Zion Spartan, where we saw Seraph pull out the Mundo and just become that unkillable monster yeah. there in the late game. And, you know, it's, it's the... It's the one form of carry, but as, as Freak mentioned, he also has the AD Bruiser Nidalee. So this guy can be a threat in multiple forms. How do you deal with that? I mean, to me, it was just like, it was just the Mundo pick. I don't feel like anything crazy happened from Seraph, but I just think it was like the Cinder Hulk, like face roll team comp, get those tanks, get, get them like having a lot of health, and you can't really do anything to them. And to me, with Winter Fox, there's just a big discrepancy between how they wanted to play and the t type of team comp they ran. So like... When Faker runs LeBlanc, there's three people mid for the whole game. Like, it's 2v1, the support's roaming mid, level 1. Wolf is, like, tornadoing the mid laner so he gets chunked. And you don't really see Glebe doing that. You don't see Helios being around mid. He picked Rek'Sai of all junglers. You need to be making plays. You need to be getting LeBlanc ahead. And that's just not happening for Winter Fox. So they either need to run these scaling Cinderhulk tanks as well, or they need to be pressuring mid lane right so that they can actually carry and Poe Belter can get snowballed. Yeah, when it comes to what we did see in game, we saw a lot of focus on the side of TDK mm -hmm. into the top lane, but their their bottom lane, right? Yeah, their, the support and ADK, their duo lane. Yeah. We saw Grog is paying a lot of attention up there and actually swaying that lane in the in favor of of Sivir. Yeah. And we had pointed out all tech and even TDK had pointed out Alltech as yep. the person to watch out for, the CS monster. He's going to come out ahead, and he's going to roll through team fights. Yeah. They did a pretty good job of stifling that. I absolutely agree. Honestly, very impressive for TDK. Luigi G was, to me, the worst AD carry and challenger up until playoffs. And then suddenly he's like doing really well, and I'm like, what, what happened to this player, and why is he suddenly very good? <laughs> but he's starting to be really, really good. Yeah, he counterpicks himself in the matchup. Right? Kalista's already locked in. He's like, yeah, we're going to play Sivir because they already have the composition in mind. Fine, it's bad lane, but you know what? It's okay. We're going to buff up Amundo. We're going to go buff up Seraph so he can go do crazy things in the back line. Kalista's a bad tank buster where well, they run two tanks who, go, who are going to run fast at the Kalista. And compositionally, they beat out Kalista. Even if the lane itself is not bad, they still managed to outplay the laning phase because of all this jungle pressure. So props to TDK. And then... You know, Essence Reaver Sivir exists. Right. Um, so, actually, I want to give you a moment to kind of yeah. preach on Essence Reaver Sivir because I'm sure a lot of people are a little confused by that purchase. It's it's interesting. Okay. So, first of all, I am, like, Crit's biggest proponent ever. Um, like, to me, the tons of damage item is actually Infinity Edge, not Trinity Force, because I, I just, I love crit chance. I love single target damage. It's... You just upset a lot of people. <laughs> Damon, but, but that's... Continue. That's the thing. Is, it's like, <laughs> generally speaking, AD cares about single target damage. Yes. Sivir is, a, is an interesting exception. I mean, we have champions like Corky and Ezreal as well, who buy Triforce or other things. But Sivir's an interesting exception. So as of 5.5 and 5.6, and these teams get accustomed to playing 
tank heavy and bruiser heavy composition. Sivir does like three really good things that other AD carries don't. So number one, she helps out other bruisers. So the Mundo runs in your backline, the Gragas runs in your backline, good things happen. Great, that's point one, team synergy. Point two is you have a big dog pile of melee champions sitting together kind of hitting each other slowly. Ricochet is amazing in these cases, right? In a, in a game where you have just Scion and then like a Kog'Maw and a Janna back here, you don't, Ricochet doesn't do anything. But Ricochet doesn't crit, and Ricochet, I guess it scales off armor pen and stuff, but if you just buy a bunch of attack damage and cooldown reduction, which is what, you know, this, this Essence Fever gives you, suddenly Ricochet becomes your greatest damage asset, and suddenly it actually works here, and actually it, in a very specific set of circumstances, becomes the optimal damage item. I don't know if I'm going to build it all the time, I don't know if I'm going to try it in solo queue, but when you've got a bunch of bruisers balling up together, well, you know what? Sivir gets to do the most damage in the game. We saw that in the post-game screen, so shout-outs to bringing that one up there as Irene. But also, yeah, when you spam Ricochet, you start to break down tanks. Yeah, and yeah, and it served to, uh, to put a lot of pressure on the lanes in terms of wave clear and being able to siege up turrets with yeah. uh, never running out of mana and having that cooldown reduction. And that is an extra, extra benefit as well, is that you've got this team who's going to outsplit push you. Like, okay, Sivir and Declista sucks. Well, I'm never going to be in lane. I'll just, like, QW the wave and then leave. And I've got a low cooldown ultimate, so I can leave more often, and, you know, Seraph's off on the side being better than Avalon, split pushing on a Cinder Hulk, and just buying time to clear waves forever and scale up into infinity, and that works. So, kind of every single part of this game, from composition to champ select to item builds, serve the purpose of, let's scale up and have a death ball. Yeah. And, and good on them for doing it. Exactly. Great to see that coming out of TDK. I do want to jump into the replay in Zion Spartan. I'm going to throw this one to you. We're going to the dragon fight that ended up as a four-for-one for TDK, resulting in a Baron. We're going to pull that up on your screens right now and let you run with it. Yeah, this is basically a team fight where you kind of see what happens. You get to that mid game with two Cinderhulk tanks and Sivir, and they're just running at you, and you can't really kill those tanks. And so you start it out, the teleport comes out, you get the dragon, and then... Yeah, they just... They can't do anything to these tanks. Like, these Mund this Mundo and this Gragas are just unkillable. Kalista and LeBlanc are just doing no damage to Ser Seraph's just walking into all of them and he takes no damage. And there's not much you can do when you can't even kill the front line. He actually ends up living. Yeah, yep. which is incredible. He even gets ignited during Merlin Amicon by a Pobelter as well. And actually, it's worth pointing out, Belter was actually late to the fight, so um, not only did TDK fight a good battle, but Winter Fox were like contesting Dragon 4v5. Then Sivirult comes in, they're like, well, we still gotta wait for Belter here, so uh, I don't know. And, and then, you know, the health prize eventually wear down. Yeah, there seemed to be a, you know, maybe a bit of an element of hubris in that Winter Fox feeling they could contest things they couldn't, shouldn't have been uh, with the minds of maybe we can outplay here. And yeah. as Irene and Freak mentioned, a lot of their game plan, I think, relied on coming out of lanes ahead. And they didn't have the gold lead that they expected to support a little yeah. bit more headstrong play. I mean, you mentioned it, right? The the champions picked. You've got LeBlanc in here who's going to snowball the mid lane usually. you got Rek'Sai, the early game jungler, who's supposed to do much, like many more things than Gragas. None of it happened. Yeah, they just have the way easier team comp to play. So if you're TDK, you can just keep doing what you're doing. Hey, let's scale. Like, please do something, Winter Fox, with uh, LeBlanc and Rek'Sai. Mm -hmm. And if they don't feel like, if they're not confident enough to snowball mid game and get Pole Belter fed with that kind of team comp, then they have to result to Cinder Hulk too, because that's the easier like champion and style to play. And they can also play Death Ball. Then the team fights will get really interesting. But since they're playing that early game style, they have to try to do something or just adapt to what. Um, TDK is doing. And you actually did see the bans come out from TDK, getting rid of Jinx and Nunu as well. I think we're actually very important. They get rid of some of that hyper carry potential of Altec. It leaves them basically on just, um, just Kogma right now, and Kogma is actually pretty easy to abuse uh, potentially in champ select. So, um, you know, I the CS machine Altec, I want to see him get on an actual carry because you know it didn't work here in Callista because you don't build crit on that champion and. It's not Saver. You can't just do that same kind of thing. Well, TDK opting to go for simple but effective. <laughs> and if, yeah. it's, if it works, it works. So when we come back, we'll jump into game two between Winter Fox and TDK. Don't go anywhere. The summer promotion tournament continues after this.